Thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm overjoyed to be here. Um, good morning from California. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it is a balmy, well, cold for us, 70 degrees, but, you know, we'll, we'll take it. Um, so, uh, again, I'm, this is some research that I'm presenting that was a chapter in my dissertation that I'm reworking into an article that I, uh, I will submit to the, the Muslim world. Uh, and so I'm very much looking forward to hearing your feedback on this presentation. Um, so give me a moment to share my slides with you. And I'm hoping these would prove to be fruitful in uh, helping you follow along. So, okay. So polemicist, apologist, or missionary Rashid Rida's Tariq al dawa So just a brief introduction. Uh, as an intellectual leader of modern Salafism, and a critical link to modern Islamic thought. Muhammad Rashid Rida was perhaps the most important Sunni Muslim scholar of the 20th century. Although Rida did not often engage in public debates with Christian missionaries, he did use his journal Al-Manar as a platform to debate with other Christian missionaries and as a mouthpiece to critique Christian missionary literature. My presentation today is a reworking of a chapter from my dissertation, which again, I would like to submit to the Journal of the Muslim World for Publication as a standalone article. In this article, I employ Rida's particular engagement with the Danish Lutheran missionary, Alfred Nielsen, as a lens to understand his general interactions with Christian missionaries in his work. In particular, I will examine how Rida responds to Nielsen in ways that are not simply binary, but rather they represent what I think are Rida's three principles, ta'in or defamation, tahrif or corruption, and da'wah, calling one to faith. I conclude this article arguing that these three principles are essential parts of Rida's tariq al-da'wah, or a method of calling others to faith, which, we, which Christians might call a, a missiology. So throughout Rida's engagement with contemporary Christians, he repeatedly appeals to the belief that Christians are harming the Muslim community and insidiously undermining the Muslim faith. To understand this foundational disposition, it is important to understand Rida's notion of ta'an. In a 1927 fatwa response to Nielsen, who asked about the controversy and conviction of Taha Hussein, Rida employs the concept of ta'an to explain the conviction. At issue was Hussein's 1926 publication on pre-Islamic poetry, which he claimed that a substantial portion of pre-Islamic poetry had been fabricated to retroactively establish a foundation for Islamic doctrines, Quranic grammar, and the context of the Quranic revelation. In his letter, Nielsen points out to Rida that if everything said against another religion was ta'in or defamation, then it would be impossible for Jews, Christians, and Muslims to live together while holding distinctly different beliefs. Nielsen was particularly interested in asking Rida about Hussein's case as he used it to segue in his letter into engaging Rida's critique that Christian missionaries were only interested in defaming Islam. Rida responded to Nielsen's question by defining ta'an as a word that originally meant to thrust or stab a, a lance into one side, or to rebuke, insult, deny, or orally disregard somebody. Rida focused on the term's emphasis on intentionally inflicting harm, either physically or emotionally. According to Rida, Hussein inflicted ta'in on the Islamic tradition in that he intentionally and, quote, painfully hurt the Muslim community in his work, and consequently rebuked the Islamic tradition. Rida, however, did not consider Nielsen's writings ta'an, for he did not think that a Muslim, Christian, or Jew engaging with each other's sacred text necessarily counted as ta'an, as long as they did not transgress their moral obligations and their critiques. In other words, a Muslim, a Christian, or a Jew could not commit ta'an by simply questioning the other's religious text or tradition. This is consistent with Rida's self-proclaimed standard 
set out by the Quranic injunction not to argue with one another, save in the most kindly manner. Thus, from this case, we can state that Rida's notion of ta'in required the perception that one intentionally and morally transgressed against another religious person or community. In his writings, Rida leveled the accusation of ta'in in his differentiation between the wise and virtuous Christians and the, quote, paid preachers. In Rida's first fatwa reply in 1924 to Nielsen, Rida employed the notion of ta'in in response to Nielsen's question regarding whether Muslims, quote, consider Christian missionaries, Christian missions in the Muslim lands as corrupting and indecent, even if they are fair and without ta'in. Nielsen also asks Rida and Muslims in general, quote, consider the enthusiastic Christian who is keen on propagating his religion and the one who neither practices religion in his life nor works to propagate it among others as being on equal footing. Rida responds that Muslims are capable of using God's gift of reason to differentiate between those good missionaries who do not defame other religions and work fairly on the behalf of others and those, quote, zealous missionaries who exploited their position for political gain and money. Rida remarked that in his hometown, he used to have many discussions with Christians who, quote, preached their religion on the basis of manifesting its values, on the basis of solid knowledge, and keeping abreast of honesty and blamelessness. Rida respected these Christian missionaries, even though these Christians were financially supported by mission agencies. Interestingly, Rida seems to have respected these missionaries because the critiques they made against Rida and the Islamic tradition were with a sincere concern for the truth and for the good of their Muslim dialogue partner. Yet Rida believed that this early missionary encounter was a unique event. By the time Rida was writing to Nielsen in 1924, he had come to believe that most Christian missionaries sought to defame Islam and Muslims. Rida made this clear in his critique of missionary publications, which he believed were produced solely to ridicule Islam and cause Muslims to doubt their faith. Consequently, he demanded that Muslims boycott these publications or destroy them. Christian missionary activity for Rida was worse than brothels or clubs. Institutions of vice might tempt Muslims to sin, but missionaries were trying to get Muslims to leave their faith entirely. Thus, although Rida encountered some wise and virtuous Christians in his youth, he had become antagonistic towards Christian missionaries in general because he saw them committing ta'an against the Muslim community. An example of this position that Christian missionary publications are vehicles for ta'an can be seen in two articles he published refuting Temple Gardner's Arabic journal, Asharq wal-Gharb. In April 1916, Gardner published an article that disputed the legal authority of the Hadith based on Ignaz Goldseeher's argument that much of the Hadith literature was fabricated after the Prophet Muhammad's death to justify contemporary theological or political positions. In fact, Gardner was skeptical of the authenticity of nearly all hadiths ascribed to the prophet. And this skepticism led him to conclude that if the traditions ascribed to the prophet are unreliable, then the system that undergirds the Islamic tradition should be disregarded. Rida accused Gardner of not taking the effort to engage with Islamic scholarship in discerning the veracity of his claims. He believed Gardner was only interested in polemically casting doubt on Muslim beliefs to make converts so that his organization would look successful. In fact, Rida frequently alleged, quote, paid preachers like Gardner were not engaging in seeking the truth, but sought polemical engagement solely for the purpose of looking good to one's mission agency. According to Rida, such insincere polemical preaching and publication for the sake of money was the purest form of ta'an. That is why in 1924, Rida wrote, quote, all missions dispatched by the Christians to the Muslims were corrupt and indecent, end quote. The problem was not Christians per se, 
forgive me, but it's not Christians per se, as this was not a critique against Arab Christians. The problem is with Christian missionaries and their agencies who are committing thought in through their publications to defame Muslims for the sake of profits. Rida's second principle in engaging with Christian missions concerns the issue of scriptural authority and the corruption of scripture or tahrif. Rida discussed these issues in his responses to Nielsen's first and second letters. In his first letter, Nielsen asks why Muslims do not seek to study the Bible when there is the hadith, seek knowledge, even in China. Nielsen also asked Rida if preaching from the Bible does not deserve the appreciation of Muslims because, quote, it either acquaints oneself with the benefits that he had not acquired before or makes him, after deep contemplation, prefer his own book. In his second letter, Nielsen challenges Rida by asking why he did not engage with the, quote, call of Christianity, since Rida was aware of Christian texts and Christian evangelism. Nielsen seems to be posing these questions to challenge Rida to consider the Bible as an authoritative scripture that must be taken seriously as a source of truth and a foundation for faith. Although Rida based much of his critique of the Bible on Quranic accounts of previous scriptures, he elaborated on his claims using the standards of Islamic sciences or hadith. First, he argued the Bible, the biblical text, does not rise to the standard of tawatr, something that is widely attested in a clear lineage of transmission, where all the transmitters are reliably authoritative. Rida asserted that the Quran and many hadiths about the Prophet Muhammad are thoroughly attested and well documented in their tawatr isnads, their widely attested, uninterrupted chains of transmission. This is in contrast to the narratives of Jesus in the Bible, which Rida thinks have few verifiable claims of transmission from their original authors. He points out that the Gospels are witnesses' accounts of singular authors based on only a few witnesses, which are not corroborated by other narrators. Rida was especially skeptical about the quality of these eyewitness accounts especially when it concerned the accounts of Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection. In a co-authored text with Muhammad Tawfiq Sidqi entitled Aqidat al-Salib wa al The Doctrine of Crucifixion and Redemption, Rida combines traditional Muslim polemics with contemporary psychology to argue the crucifixion and resurrection accounts are not tawatur because their narrators were in a irrational psychological mental state. Rida's argument against the veracity of the crucifixion recapitulates a classical Muslim argument that instead of Jesus, the Romans put someone who looked like Jesus because God changed this man's appearance to look like Jesus. Regarding the resurrection, Rida argued not only did the authors not personally witness the event, but the fact that Mary Magdalene initially doubted her encounter with the resurrected Jesus constituted a weakening of the narrator's veracity. If Mary Magdalene, along with the disciples, were initially uncertain about Jesus's resurrection, then Rida considers this an uncertain account and therefore not to water. Additionally, Rida points out that Mary Magdalene was not reliable witness because she was of immoral character and had been afflicted by devils. Therefore, according to Rida, the standards of the gospel accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection do not rise to the level of tawatr, making them unfit for informing one's faith and practice. Rida then employs contemporary understandings of human psychology to argue the narrators of the crucifixion and resurrection might have been suffering from hysteria. Both Sidqi and Rida believed Mary and the disciples were overcome with a hysteria of nervous excitement from fear or sorrow over the apparent loss of Jesus. In such circumstances, people can imagine events such as dead people talking to them or hysterical visions. 
Reda elaborated on this point using Gustave Le Bon's idea discerning quote or concerning quote, the suggestibility and credulity of crowds in his book, The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind. Reda was particularly drawn to Le Bon's discussion of communal thought through shared imaginaries and how such Im images can cause the creation of subsequent images with no connection to the former reality. Le Bon argued that distortion begins with one individual, but the effect of this distortion can become amplified through the collective imagination of the distortion, which is picked up and broadcasted. This contagion of distortions are called collective hallucinations. Rudda argued that if these psychologists were correct in that collective imagination can affect people's memories, then he argued it is possible that the witness accounts of the crucifixion were suffering delusions. In other words, if those who related Jesus's resurrection were hysterical to the extent that they saw things that were not really there, i.e. Jesus on the cross and a resurrected Jesus, then how can one rely on their testimony? Thus, Rida concluded that based on the standards of Tawata, which stipulates numerous pious and rational narrators, the biblical narrative of the crucifixion and resurrection fail to attain that standard. Rida's skepticism towards the authority of the biblical narrative because of a lack of Tawata reliability leads to his conclusion that the biblical text is susceptible to and in fact has suffered corruption. In his fatwa reply to Nielsen's first letter, Rida argued the Bible no longer bears God's truth because it has fallen victim to tahrif, intentional corruption. Specifically, Rida pointed to the Quran's claim that Christians, quote, have been given a portion of the book, but, in a, but a section of them have turned away. The Quran also claims that Christians and Jews, quote, changed the words from their right places and forgot a good part of the message that was sent to them, end quote. Although Ridda bases his arguments on the Quranic text, he believed that Western biblical criticism vindicated his arguments for the authenticity of the Muslim scriptures and undermined the authenticity of the Bible. An example of Ridda's use of European biblical criticism was his utilization of the newly discovered Hammurabic Code with Friedrich Dielitz's work Babel und Babelstreit. In 1903, Dielitz gave a lecture in the Deutsche Orient Gesellschaft before Emperor Wilhelm II, where he argued that the narratives of the Hebrew Bible borrow from Assyrian mythology. His lecture examined the particular relationship between the Mosaic laws and the Hammurabic codes, affirming that the latter informed and influenced the former. Looking at this argument, Rida sees affirmation that pagan influences such as Hammurabi's code were interpolated into the Hebrew Bible. Based on his conclusion that the biblical text has been compromised through tahrif, Rida asserted that Christians believe in illogical propositions, and Christian missionaries are trying to get Muslims to follow illogical beliefs. Rida claimed that this was not a position only he held. He alleged that many Christians personally told him that the doctrines of the crucifixion and salvation and the Trinity cannot be proven rationally. This, he argued, is in contrast to Islam, whose fundamental doctrines conform to human rationality. For example, Rida thought it was incredulous that Christians believed God could not find a way to, quote, combine his mercy with his justice, except through the incarnation into a human being, Jesus, who would bear pain, torture, and curse in order to salvage humanity for punishment, end quote. Rida found it equally nonsensical that God would require people to believe in such irrational doctrines to merit salvation. It is because of these irrational doctrines rooted in corrupted texts that Rida tells Nielsen he is not interested in heeding the, quote, call to Christianity. 
Now, before moving on to Rida's concept of da'wa, it would be appropriate to pause for a minute and re-examine the relationship between Rida's conception of ta'an and his polemic of tahrif. Uh, Rida was open to critical discussions of the Islamic tradition, so long as Christian missionaries did not malign sacred beliefs of the Muslim community, such as the coherency of the Quran. Malign the community itself, singling Muslims out for negative treatment, or transgress the ethical standards of conversation as set in the Quranic passage 2946. On the one hand, Rida disapproved of Christian missionaries critiquing Islam, calling them acts of ta'an. On the other hand, Rida was open to Christians, Jews, and Muslims critiquing one another's scriptures, so long as they remained within their, quote, moral obligations. This creates a tension between what constitutes legitimate criticism, morally obligated critiques, and what constitutes ta'an, Christian missionaries critiquing Islam. This is particularly the case when we look at Rida's work on tahrif as a polemic against Christianity. As I previously discussed, Rida accused Christians and Jews of intentionally corrupting their scriptures and inserting additional beliefs into what God revealed to his messengers. Rida based this accusation on the Quranic text 513, which Rida used as a warrant for making his claim of tahrif. If ta'an is an act that is outside of the moral obligations of one's tradition, then it seems that Rida used the Quran to justify his polemics as within the boundaries of God's own critiques against Christians and Jews. In other words, Rida did not seem to believe his accusations of tahrif were acts of ta'an because he believed he was explicitly explicating a claim already made in the Quran and thus making it within his own personal moral obligation. Rida's confidence in the power of Quranic claims comes his, from his belief that Islam teaches what is fundamental to all human nature. And Rida highlighted this point in his first fatwa response to Nielsen's question, quote, who is better? The one who adheres to a religion right af uh, after conviction and practices it in his life, or he who remains in the religion of his ancestors without inner belief, nor adapting his life according to the highly ranked and celebrated values of religion. Rida responded that the adherent of a religion is the only sincere follower if they are convinced by the truth of that religion. Quote, submitting psychologically and practically to it by performing worship, steering well clear of all prohibited acts and committing to all its rulings and ethics, save the slight infringements for which he shows remorse and seeks divine forgiveness, end quote. Rida asserted that such a conviction can only be had with Islam because Muslims are not required to believe anything logically impossible. This position stands in particular contrast to Christian doctrines such as the Trinity and the Incarnation, which are presented as holy mysteries and not logical proofs. Thus, Rida was certain that Christian missions were futile as they were asking Muslims to follow beliefs that were not in accordance with human reason. Now, although Rida did not believe in the potency of Christian missions amongst the Muslims, he was perturbed by the number of Muslims who began questioning their faith after engaging with Christian missions. Rida's certainty of his beliefs and his concern over the seemingly deterioration of his fellow Muslims' beliefs highlights the third principle through which we can better understand Rida's engagement with Christian missions, da'wah, or calling to faith. Rida envisioned three different concepts of da'wah in his work. Rida's first conceptualization of da'wah is towards the Muslim community. Rida believed Muslims had become ignorant of their faith and that Christian missionaries and colonists have been exploiting their weakness. The second way Rida conceived of da'wah is towards non-Muslims. Rida believed that Islam was in and of itself appealing to all people, 
and that it was the duty of all Muslims to call the world to follow the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. Rida's third conceptualization of, of da'wah is the fitrah, the internal natural human disposition to worship God. Although Rida does not explicitly use the term da'wah in relation to fitrah, he argues that it is human nature to have a fitra that calls one back to truth and worship. In this section, I will suggest that Rida understood this inner natural calling of one's fitra as a foundational da'wah upon which he bases his understanding of da'wah towards Muslims and non-Muslims. Rida's first two conceptualizations of da'wah were formed in a dialectic with Christian missionary schools. Although Rida was initially positive about missionary schools and the Western advancement of science and technology, his attitude changed over time to suspect all Western in, uh, intervention as part of colonization. He believed colonial nations used missionary schools to reshape their colonies into Christian nations. He believed colonial nations, uh, sorry, although missionary schools often required their students to attend church and listen to lectures on Christianity, Rida was not concerned that Muslims would convert to Christianity. Rather, they would become atheists because Christianity was illogical. He believed if a Muslim did convert to Christianity, it was due to poverty and a desire to re receive missionaries' financial aid. <clears throat> this, Rida emphasized, is unlike Westerners who convert to Islam, like Baron Lord Headley, an Irish aristocrat who converted in 1913. Although Rida did not believe that Christian missionary schools would convert Muslims to Christians, he was irritated that Muslims entering the missionary schools would leave doubting their faith. He believed students attending such schools would become ignorant of their own faith, give, give precedence to foreign languages over Arabic, and develop lax morals and become antinomian. Despite these concerns, Rida was unclear in his writings concerning missionary schools. On the one hand, he did not forbid Muslims from attending these schools. In fact, he selectively recommended missionary schools as a means to learn Western scientific advances in order to better integrate uh, these advancements into the Islamic tradition and the Muslim world. On the other hand, however, he did not fully endorse Muslims attending these schools. Rada believed that the reason Muslims sent their children to these dangerous schools was because there was not a similar Muslim school. Therefore, he concluded the establishment of an equally robust Muslim institution of learning is a fard kifaya, a duty that must be fulfilled by a certain number of Muslims. Now, in addition to his journal, which he saw as fulfilling the need to educate Muslims, Rida <clears throat> established the short-lived Dar al-Da'wah wa al-Irshad in Cairo in 1912. This was a private Muslim institution intended to further Rida's two visions of da'wah. The institution would train murshids or guides who would combat deviation within the Muslim community by educating Muslims, particularly on Rida's Salafi vision of the Islamic tradition. Additionally, the institute would train du'at or preachers to spread the Muslim mission to non-Muslims and defend Islam from missionaries. He lamented that Muslims were failing to propagate their faith in light of Christian missionaries who were more successful in translating Christianity into indigenous languages and customs to better suit local perspectives. Rida believed that the current political conflicts amongst Muslims, the lack of Western education about Islam, and the persistence of superstitious beliefs amongst Muslims were the largest obstacles preventing Westerners from embracing Islam. Rida even wished for a group of educated Muslim missionaries in America and England, quote, to uncover the swindle of politicians and missionaries who have caused enmity and animosity between Islam and Europe, end quote. He believed 
this would lead people in those countries to embrace Islam in droves. And thus, he hoped his institution would begin to heal the Muslim community from within while spreading Islam abroad. But with this confidence that Westerners would become, would come to Islam and that Muslims would follow a Salafi approach to Islam comes from his conception of da'wah as a da'wah of one's fitrah. In his commentary on the Quran, Tafsir al-Manar, he discusses the connection between one's fitrah and salvation in the verses 262, 4115, 4123, 319, and 569. Rida's general argument was that the fitrah calls all humans back to the worship of God, which is Islam, and that this is consistent and a constant internal calling that resonates with reason and revelation. Although Ridda distinguished between Islam as true worship of God, no matter the context, and Islam, the religious tradition, he was quick to add that God rebuked the people of the book due to their deviations from the true religion. This is because Ridda believed that by the time of the Prophet Muhammad, the Jewish and Christian traditions no longer represented Islam. The Prophet's charge was to re-inaugurate a path for Islam. This entails that Ridda thought to follow the path of Islam equated to following the path of the Prophet Muhammad. In other words, although Ridda argued that the Islamic tradition was not necessarily Islam, he concluded that to be a Muslim, one had to follow the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. This conclusion seems to entail that all those who do not follow the Quran or the Prophet Muhammad's teachings are not Muslims and therefore do not follow Islam and are subsequently condemned. And although Ridda to a certain degree condemns those who do not follow the Prophet Muhammad as not following God's revelation, he does not condemn all non-Muslims. Instead, he believes only those who reject the Prophet out of selfish desire are condemned. We find Ridda discussing this belief in his concluding comments on 319, where he argues, no one can be credited with belief who knows the Quran and yet disagrees with it by preferring his own scriptures. Everyone reached by the call of Muhammad and to whom its truth is evident, as is to certain self-absorbed stubborn people of the book, but who rejects and resists as they reject and resist gains no positive credit for his belief in former prophets and their book. What is interesting here, pardon me, what is interesting here is that Ridda limits condemnation to non-Muslims who have, quote, been reached by the call of, the, of Muhammad and to whom its truth is evident, end quote. However, Rida is not clear who meets these qualifications, one reached by Muhammad's call and to whom the truth was made evident. This ambiguity complicates the status of the sincere truth-seeking person who hears the prophet's message, is motivated to investigate the prophet's message, but does not follow the prophet. A possible clue to Ridda's thought on this matter is in his commentary on 4115. If anyone opposes the messenger after guidance has been made clear to him and follows a path other than that of what he, uh, of the believers, we shall leave him on his chosen path. We shall burn him in hell, an evil destination. In his commentary, Ridda elaborates on 10 different ways that individuals can interact with the prophet's message based on one's fitrah. The most important and pertinent to our discussion in this section are the first, second, seventh, eighth, and ninth ways. Um, so I'm skipping a couple of the other ones, just focusing on the ones pertinent to this research. So the first and second ways of engaging the prophet's message are, are similar, and Rida is equally condemnatory of those who leave the faith from these two positions. 
The first way is where one is absolutely certain of the prophet's message and later rejects the message. The second way is to not be absolutely certain about the prophet's message, but the prophet's message is accepted as divine guidance. Although Rida does not use this term, I like to call this group the enlightened because the truth has been made evident to them. The benefit of this group is that they are Muslim, those who follow Islam and the teachings of the, of the Quran and the prophet. However, if someone from this enlightened group subsequently rejects the prophet's message, then Ridda considers them worthy of damnation because they fully assented to Islam and subsequently rejected the faith. Ridda, however, believes there are only a few people who fall into this group of enlightened deniers. This is because Ridda believes the Prophet's message is harmonious with one's fitra, which prefers truth over falsehood, guidance over error, and good over evil. If the Prophet's message is divine truth, which Ridda believes was the case, then people could not resist the message's transformative power. In other words, if the message was made clear, then people could not help but desire the prophet's message. Thus, if the message was made clear to someone and they followed it, then rejecting the prophet's message is equivalent to rejecting one's own fitra, which Rida found particularly condemnable. The only reason he could see for such a choice was either tribal stubbornness or the pursuit of desire over truth. Thus, those who are condemned are those who have faith in the prophet's Muhammad and the uh, prophet Muhammad's message, but then reject it out of selfish desire. But this notion of the irresistible response of the fitra to the prophet's message is important when trying to understand Rida's explanation of the sincere truth-seeking non-Muslim who encounters the prophet's message, but rejects it for reasons other than selfishness or stubbornness. Rida discusses this type of person in his seventh, eighth, and ninth type of interactions with the Prophet's message in his commentary on 4115. The seventh grouping consists of those who were exposed to an improper version of the message. Rida believes they will not be condemned because they did not encounter that which would stimulate their fitra and lead to investigation. Rida believes most non Muslims during his lifetime fell into this category. The eighth grouping consists of those who sincerely investigated the message after encountering it, but stop when the truth is not apparent to them. Like the seventh group, Rida does not condemn them because the truth was not made apparent and therefore does not prompt a fitra response. Finally, there are those sincere truth seekers who investigate the message. And even when the complete truth of the message is not evident, continue investigating. Rida claims the Quranic verse 4115 does not condemn any of these three individuals because the truth was never made evident to them. This does not mean that people from this group will never be judged. Rather, they will be judged by what they know to be moral and true in relation to the prophet's message and from their own rational deductions. Again, the only people who are condemned are those who have heard the message, found it to be divine truth, and then rejected it out of stubborn, selfish desires, or those who saw it as being possibly true and then, then didn't even bother investigating it, which is uh, both of which are a denial of their fitra response. Rida's, Rida's notion of the fitra's reflexive, positive response to the truth of the Prophet Muhammad's message is foundational to his da'wah project to re-educate Muslims and engage non-Muslims. According to Rida, Islam is rational and correlates to the natural disposition of human nature. This is in contrast to Christianity and all other religions which he believed required people to believe in illogical propositions or follow unbalanced moral teachings. Taking Rida's argument that Islam is the natural religion of the fitra helps us understand the relationship he saw between da'wah towards Muslims and da'wah towards non-Muslims. Concerning the Muslim community, 
Rida was afraid that the Islamic tradition they perceived had veered away from the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, and thus away from the deen al-fitrah, the natural desire that is Islam. What was worse was that these stray Muslims were listening to Christian missionary teachings, which Rida argued were also deviations from deen al-fitrah. Thus, Muslims were not only veering away from the deen al-fitrah, from within the Islamic tradition, but they were listening to teachings that would further lead them away from the right path. So in this article, I have argued that incorporating the three parts, the three paradigms of ta'in, tahrif, and dawa provide an explanatory potential for understanding Rida's approach to Christian missionaries. I suggested these concepts of ta'in and tahrif help us understand why Rida was affirming of the Christian religion as a general concept, but not of Christian missionaries in particular. Rida was amenable to Christian missionaries as long as Christians respected the beliefs and prophets in sacred texts of Islam, but, not, but did not malign specific Muslims or the Muslim community. This is evident in his interaction with Nielsen and his claim that he had such relations in Tripoli. His paradigm of tahrif helps provide a method by which Muslims can emphasize the inherent truthfulness of the Quran and the Muslim faith. By taking a theological perspective of Rida's concept of da'wah, we see that the apologetic and polemical project of tahrif is part of a larger project, convincing non-Muslims and Muslims of Islam's truthfulness. By incorporating these three principles, Together, we have a more robust understanding of what I term Rida's tariq dawa, or path or method of calling one to faith. Although this tariq dawa is not synonymous with missiology, it is like a Christian missiology in that both contain praxis and theology. With respect to praxis, Rida presents moral paradigms, ta'an and apologetic and polemical paradigms, tahrif, and has incorporated these into a curriculum for training Muslims to do dawah against non-Muslims and Muslims alike in his institution. I've also presented Rida's theology of dawah as one's fitra response, as providing explanatory power for Rida's understanding of Islam's inherent truthfulness and the manner in which Rida dealt with non-Muslims who sincerely investigated Islam but were not Muslims, such as Nielsen. I am not suggesting that these three principles are the sum total of Rida's tariq al-dawah. Rather, I am suggesting that if we want to present and understand Rida's missiology, or better yet, his tariq al-dawah, then there needs to be much more research that connects Rida's theology with his engagement with non-Muslims. Thank you for the time, and I am looking forward to your questions and comments.